today, I'll pull in and I'll walk through the garage, close the garage door, walk through the mudroom, turn into my living room, and one of the first devices that I will see there uh, is one that's supposed to set the temperature for my house. You've got one in your house too, the thermostat. I will see that there, and I- I'm hoping when I get home, I, that first digit of the number that's the, reading the thermostat says a, a six or a seven, otherwise we've got a big problem, right? Because that is what's supposed to control the air conditioning or the heating in my house to uh, tell what the temperature should B, and that's how a thermostat works. Now, there is a thermometer involved. There is something in uh, your thermostat that is reading the temperature so it can know what the temperature is so that it can be set. But the, the th- thermometer is not the controlling device. And, and imagine if this was how your thermostat worked. Imagine that uh, your thermometer for your thermostat was actually outside of your house. And then what your thermostat was trying to do was to make the inside of your house mirror the outside of your house. How would you like that? Uh, Get home from work on a nice July Treasure Valley day and see your thermostat reading 102. Ah, yeah, that's the good stuff, right? Not so much. Not I, I doubt one person, uh, we got some crazy people who love heat that might sign up for that, but most of you are not signing up for that. Or those chilly nights in the winter when it dips down into the single digits. You want the inside of your house reflecting that? No, that's not how thermostats are supposed to work. Well, guess what? That's not how preaching is supposed to work either. And the idea I want you to see today is that the preaching of God's word is meant to be a thermostat for the church. The preaching of God's word is meant to set the temperature and the tone and the direction for the people of God. It is not meant to reflect what is going on on the outside. If you don't want a thermometer on the outside dictating what's going on in your house, then you definitely shouldn't want a thermometer of what's going on on the outside dictating what goes on in God's house. We're going to set that temperature with the word of God. And if you just think about that in your own home, you realize, yikes, that would be such a problem if that's how my home thermostat was run. I, I hope you can start to quickly see the importance of why that would be so problematic for the church as well. And so I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, where we see a passage that talks about this, the preaching of God's word. And we're in week two of a series where we're going through the eight distinctives of Compass Bible Church, commitments that we hold as a church. Last week, we looked at the first distinctive, the Bible is central. This case, I want to show you from the Bible why we think it's important to have distinctive number two, that we showcase expository preaching. This is what we mean by that on our website, because God's written revelation to us is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, it is our intention to allow it to utilize compass preachers to get to our hearts and minds as they open the word and let its message out. Our goal is that compass pastors won't use the Bible to preach their messages, but that the Bible will use compass pastors to preach its message, God's powerful and life-changing truth. And even just defining one of those terms there, expository, that means that the content is coming from the text. Expository, the word comes from the Latin word expositus, which means to expose. You see that word in expository, expose, to expose or explain. That's what expository preaching is doing. And what is it exposing or explaining? It's the text of God's word. And this passage is going to guide us in our understanding of that. But before we read it, I want to give another reminder. Even this series, going through the distinctives of our church, it is not meant to be an eight-week-long pat on the back, hey, look at us and how good of a job we're doing. It is meant to be, hey, these are the commitments we want to make. These are the commitments that we believe God is calling a healthy church to do. We want to keep striving for that, and it should challenge each and every one of us. So with that in mind, let's look at our text. Follow along as I read 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. 
For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So right from the beginning of that passage, you see how serious this is. I charge you. That that has a solemnity to it. I I charge you in the presence of God. That's a serious beginning. And if you understand the context of this, you see how it's even more serious. This is written in a letter from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. And at this point, the Apostle Paul, from everything we understand, he is about to die. And he, he knows that. We just finished Philippians. Paul was in prison in Rome. And as you read that, He expects that he will be released. And from what we understand from history and tradition, he was released. He did more ministry, but then he ends up back in a Roman prison. And this time the expectation is, I'm not making it out. And that's what you see in 2 Timothy. He is expecting to die. And he is writing to Timothy, who was a companion, a friend, and really his protege, someone that he has invested so much in. So the words themselves, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, are serious, but the context even amplifies how important this is. Timothy, this may be the last time I ever get to talk to you, and even looking in the book, this is going to be one of the last things I maybe ever say to you, and I'm charging you in the presence of God to preach the word. It's important, and then he brings in various factors. First, in the presence of God wasn't just a rhetorical device. No, hey, Timothy, God is real. He is here. Jesus is watching you. This is in the presence of God uh, but Then in Christ Jesus. But then all these other things really bring a sense of accountability. It highlights the role of Jesus as the judge. He will judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. He's coming back. He will appear again, and he will reign. He is the authority. He is coming back. He will judge. And all those things give that sense of accountability, which is something, if you read all of the Apostle Paul's writings, something he was very clearly aware of. He was very clearly aware that someday he would stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be evaluated by him. Is that something that you are aware of? Is that something you are aware of often? Is that something that you live your life in light of, that you someday will stand before Jesus Christ? That is really the final exam of your life. So Someday you will stand before him. So let's put it down this way for point number one. Prepare for your final exam. Prepare for your final exam. And maybe for some of you, that brings back some experiences from finals when you were in school and trying to prepare for those in a class maybe where you knew if I don't do well on this final, I will bomb the class. Or maybe you think of some other test you had to prepare for, whether that was your SATs or or you had to take some exam to get into graduate school. Or many of you, I'm sure, you've had to be licensed in something as an adult for your job and you felt the pressure of passing that exam. Well, None of those come anywhere close to matching the weight of someday I will stand before Jesus Christ. And what I'm trying to say is what's going to prepare you for that? What's going to prepare you for that examination? The word. The word is what is going to prepare you. And when the Bible speaks of the judgment of Jesus Christ, there are multiple ways it talks about it. And the first is really a a pass-fail Wait, you're going to die, and then comes the judgment, and you will end up in one of two places. You will end up with Christ in heaven forever, or you will end up separated from Christ, experiencing the wrath of God forever in hell. Those are the two destinations to which humans will head, and you will be judged in that way. Well, guess what's going to prepare you for that? The Bible. And even our passage this week directly follows what we looked at last week. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And if you go back to verse 15 there, it highlights that. Even how Timothy from childhood had been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The only way, way to be prepared for dying is faith in Christ. Putting your trust in him as the savior that you need. 
We put our trust in him because we are all sinners. None of us are ready for that test. None of us are ready for that examination. But Jesus came and he passed the test that you and I have all failed. And he died as our substitute to take the wrath that you and I deserve. And he's willing to swap. Hey, you take my perfect score, I'll take your punishment. That's the good news of the gospel. And we are called to turn from our sin and put our faith in Christ in his death, and in his resurrection. And that's the only thing that will prepare you. Are you ready for that test? Are you ready to die and and be judged and either sent uh, to hell or welcomed into eternity with Christ? Some of you, you're still holding on to your sin and you have not turned from that. You're not ready for that test. And maybe some of you, your faith isn't in Christ. Your faith is in yourself, thinking I've done good enough to pass that test. Well, here's the thing. You're not going to be graded by your own standards on that day. You're going to be graded by Christ's, and you will all fail. We will all fail. The only way is through faith in Christ and him being our substitute. But I think this doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Aside from the pass fail, I'm going to heaven or I'm going to hell, the Bible makes clear even all Christians, you will be evaluated by Christ. Judgment is used in that Sense. And to show that to you from the Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we see the Apostle Paul talk about this. And he's talking about being at home in the body, being absent from the Lord, walking by faith and not by sight. But someday, if we're absent from the body, we will be at home with The Lord. And so, even all of that, we, we will be at home with the Lord. He's clearly talking to believers here, people that are not headed to destruction or hell. And so, he says in verse 9 so, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. If you are a Christian, the goal of your life in this world should be, I want to please Christ. Why? Verse 10 for we, believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Uh, Now, we know for Christians, Romans 8, there is no condemnation. There is no judgment in that sense. There's no purgatory, nothing like that. There will be, though, an evaluation of your works by Christ Jesus. Another passage that looks at that that you could look at later is 1 Corinthians 3 which talks about our works as Christians being tested. And some will be wood, hay, and straw, and they'll be consumed by the fire. But gold, silver, precious stones, those will withstand the test and we will be rewarded. And for the works that weren't so good, there's going to be a loss in that, even though we're saved. We are in heaven. You will be held accountable before Christ. And so as we think as that relates to preaching, that should affect the preacher and it should affect the congregation. Let's start with the preacher. Every preacher will be accountable to God for what he has taught. Our preaching will be evaluated by him. I spent almost 10 years working at our sending church, and one thing we would do from time to time was sermon evaluations, where the lead pastor of the church, he would gather up basically all that he could, and one of us would have to kind of offer up one of our sermons. We'd put it up on the TV in the conference room, and we would watch it, and the lead pastor would evaluate it. And the thing is, you were always doing that with an audience. It wasn't just you and him. He would grab as many other people around the office as he could. And so you're sitting there, and everybody's watching you be evaluated. I'll be honest, it was pretty intimidating. It's not nearly as serious as it's going to be when Jesus Christ evaluates my sermons. Or if you're responsible for proclaiming the truth of God, when he evaluates what you have said in the name of Jesus. That's going to be serious. And that's a weight every preacher should feel. James 3 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And if you're thinking, glad I'm not a preacher or a teacher, well, this should affect you because guess what? You also are going to end up in the presence of God. And you may not then be held accountable for your teaching if you weren't a teacher, but still, what kind of life did you live? Did you please Christ? If that's to be your goal, someday you're going to find out if you accomplished that goal or not. Did you please Christ or not? And what is going to prepare you for that test? Biblical preaching will prepare you for that. 
Well, a lot of money gets spent on test prep. High school students getting ready for their SATs, accountants trying to pass the CPA exam. You can spend a lot of money on resources to prepare you for those tests. You can get prepared for the ultimate test every week for free at your local church when they're teaching the Bible. And you should say, hey, I I need that because I am aware of my accountability to Christ and I want to be ready. And yes, there's a weight of that thought of standing before Christ. There should also be a joy if you know his word and you're using that as your compass in life. You can approach that judgment with a confidence, with a joy. Because you know the standard that you will be judged by. You know God's word. And so as we think through these things and each of the points this morning, I want to give you one kind of extra thought, specifically as you think about approaching the the preaching at your local church each week. And in light of this accountability, I, I would encourage you also to prepare prayerfully. Prepare prayerfully for preaching every week. Because you know, I'm going to stand before Christ someday, and I am going to hear his word taught. I want to listen. I want to be ready, because I want to be ready for that day when I will stand before Christ. And just very practically, if you've ever signed up for anything at our church, you're going to be getting our church emails on Friday. And those emails will always announce, this is the sermon and this is the text for this weekend. Weekend. And I would just encourage you, please, read that passage and pray about it before you come to church. Read the passage you know is going to be taught on and pray about it. I would, this isn't selfish, I think this is good for the church. I would ask you to pray for the preacher. Pray for the preacher in that passage, but also pray for yourself. Pray that, hey God, I want this passage to help me get ready to stand before Christ. If you go to England or or places in Europe, often if you're going to one of those old church buildings to get inside the building, you're going to have to walk through a graveyard to get there. And as we've pursued land, one thing I've asked Chris, our business administrators, I'm like, hey, one thing we should at least ask, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is going to be, is what are the rules about that? Because personally, I don't think that would be the worst thing in the world to have to walk through a graveyard on your way into church. I'm going to end up there, and that's why I need to go in there to prepare me for that. And and partly because we live in a world that's so sanitized, death is out of sight, out of mind. No, we need to think more about death because that's going to be the end for all of us if Christ doesn't come back first. Am I ready for that? Am I ready to stand before God? That's one of the purposes. That's the lead up to the command to preach the word because we're going to stand before Jesus Christ, the judge of the living and the dead. So get ready. And that leads then, as we go back to 2 Timothy, to five commands that Paul gives to Timothy. And the first one is the banner. All the rest kind of follow up and explain the first command. And that first command is simply preach the word. Hey, Timothy, pastor, and this is one of what we call in the Bible the pastoral epistles, specifically that pastors, hey, look at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, because that was Paul training up pastors. So what should pastors do? They should preach the word. And the word there for preach is the Greek word caruso, which means to publicly herald. And it brings us back into the day when the king would issue an edict, a command, or or have some message. And the king couldn't use social media to get that out. There was no television or radio broadcasts to get that out. So he would send out these messengers, send out these heralds who would come into town. Silence, a message from the king. Gather around, hear what the king has to say. That's that's the idea. And, And the word is a very common word. It's More often even than translated preach is translated proclaim. And we see it used in all kinds of contexts in the synagogue, in the wilderness. uh, Some that are more formal settings, some that are more informal settings, some that are very public, some that are more private. And even if you study that word, you might actually realize, wait, I actually am doing preaching because are you evangelizing others? Are you proclaiming the word of God and the gospel to them? Maybe you are doing some preaching that you will be held accountable for some day. But even as we talk this morning, we're going to think about it more in the context of church as Paul is instructing this pastor. But as you think through that, one of the ideas that should come clearly from that word, Caruso, and the, the heralds proclaiming the message of a king is authority. Proclaiming is not just a matter of, of volume. Oh, this is talking, but this is preaching. No, it's, it's the authority behind the message. 
I'm not just giving my opinion. I'm not just saying something. I am proclaiming an authoritative message. That's the idea of preaching. We're proclaiming the authoritative message from our God and King. We are preaching the word. And that's the substance. The word there, again, if we think of our passage from last week, it's using a lot of synonymous terms that should really get us thinking about the Bible. Whether it's the word, um, all scripture, back in verse 16, the sacred writings, uh, that's what we are to be proclaiming. And obviously at the center of that message, the other word that's sometimes translated preach in the New Testament is specifically tied to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is our mission. And that's central in Paul's command. And because this is a command given to a pastor, we want that to be central in our church and even in our service. So we can say we showcase kind of the centerpiece of church each week is the exposition, the proclamation of God's word. And we think that needs to be at the center because there's always going to be a temptation towards something else. That gets us to the second command there. Preach the words, the first one. The second one is be ready. And then it says be ready in season and out of season. And there should be a link there because if you look at verse 3, it says for the time is coming. But that Greek word time is the word that basically is translated season in verse two. So it's saying, be ready in season and out of season, then verse three, because a season is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Uh, But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So we need to proclaim this authoritative message, but we need to long for the right thing. We need to have our appetites trained towards the truth, not just what we want to hear or for a preacher, what we want to say. Point number two, train your appetites towards truth. Train your appetites toward truth. And again, that applies to the pastor and the teacher saying, I don't want to just get up here and give my own opinions. I I want to give up there, get up there and give the word of God. I want to proclaim the word, not just my thoughts. Uh, I want to proclaim the truth. And for the congregant, that, the, the hearer, that should be, well, I want to come and hear the truth. I, I don't just want to come and hear something that makes me feel better. Give it to me straight. Give me the word of God. Whether that convicts me or encourages me, that, that doesn't really matter. I need the word. I need the truth of God's word. And that's why we want the, the pulpit to be at the center of the church. But more importantly, the pulpit had better be centered on the truth of God's word. That's the only way that this works. Again, if you look at history, you see that the proclamation of God's truth has always been central to God's people. Whether you go back to the Old Testament, even in in the prophets, or Jesus and the apostles, or other seasons in history like the Reformation or the Great Awakening, the word is what does the work. Even Martin Luther, as he reflected on the events of the Reformation, he wasn't stoking himself up and and giving himself the credit. He was saying the word did it all. It was the word that brought about the change. Or as we like to say here, revival comes from the Bible. That's where it's going to happen. And we need churches today to wake up and put the Bible back at the center of the church and the center of the pulpit. And to be bold in proclaiming the truth of God's word. One of my preaching heroes who God used to bring revival in a couple different places, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Is it not clear as you take a bird's eye view of church history that the decadent or weak periods and eras in the history of the church have always been those periods when preaching had declined? What is it that always heralds the dawn of a reformation or of a revival? It is renewed preaching. When you take the word out of the pulpit, the pulpit gets weak. And when the pulpit gets weak, the church gets weak. And when the church gets weak, the society around it will suffer consequences as a result of that. If we want to strengthen the society around us, well, we need to strengthen the pulpit. And the way to strengthen the pulpit is by proclaiming the word, not our opinions, but the truth of God's word. There's a scene in the old book, Moby Dick, where the, the, the narrating character, Ishmael, he, he's at church. And it's going into great detail describing this impressive pulpit that the preacher was getting up into, which that's a total side point. But when we get a full-time facility, we're going to put some of you woodworkers uh, to work to 
give us something a little more substantial than this. But that's for another time. Uh, But as it's describing this, it, it gives this commentary. It says, for the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. Well, you might look and say, that's certainly not how it is now. And I think if we delve into history, we find out I don't, how much was that ever the case, at least faithful preaching in pulpits. Always seems like it's actually been in the minority, but that's really where it should be because by pulpit, we're really referring to the preaching. And the preaching of God's word should lead the world. Preaching is important because that's where we hear from the king. And that's what we all need to crave. Again, on the preacher's end, the preacher needs to crave that by saying, what does the Bible say? And that's the, that's the biggest part of sermon preparation is I need to study the text and understand what God is saying through his word. And again, from, uh, and again, from the preacher's perspective, the, the goal is I'm not using the Bible to proclaim my message. But unfortunately, that's what you see, especially in a lot of American churches. Hey, guys, here's an idea, and we're never really going to open our Bibles, but I'll throw up a few references that are all from different translations to match my point the best instead of really digging into a text and saying, what is its point? That's what we want to do. I want to expose the Bible's message for you. And even that explains why we generally preach through books of the Bible. And this eight-week series on the distinctives is probably about as long of a series as you'll ever catch us doing here at this church, where it's not moving through consecutive passages of Scripture. And from the congregation's perspective, you should be saying, give me the Bible. When I show up, I expect to need my Bible, and and I expect to be taught what it means. And I expect to be able to look at it and say, yes, that makes sense. And I do want to give thanks and commend you. I do believe that God has gifted us with what I would call an in-season church. A, A congregation full of people that want to hear the word. And if I wasn't proclaiming the word, I think I would hear about it from several of you, and that's a good thing, right? And even that's what I hear so often is so many people have moved here and look for a church. As they get involved in our church, many times what I hear people say is, man, we were just so happy to find a church that was just teaching the Bible. And my response is always, I'm so sorry that that's so hard to find. It shouldn't be that way. But unfortunately, in our culture, often it is. And even if, hey, We've got some good things going as an in-season church that's always going to be under threat. There's always going to be temptation to waver and to drift from that, both from the preacher's perspective and from the hearer's perspective. And a couple of things that will always be tempting, one I would say is bad theology. There's always just bad theology out there that is really driven by kind of what we talked about last week, where we make ourselves the standard. And God wouldn't do anything that I wouldn't do. And so not only do I not really want to teach about hell, I don't even know if I believe in it. Because would God actually do that? And then, you know, these miracles, we're so sophisticated with modern science. Are miracles really real? I don't know about that. And maybe we don't even need them to be real to get the message, right? That's all bad, false theology. That's coming from a humanistic perspective instead of submitting to God and his word. But also, in many churches, there's what I would call a self-centered theology, where they'll say things that aren't false, but it's it's the focus that is off. Because there'll be a lot of talk about how powerful God is, how loving God is, how faithful God is. All of those things are gloriously true. But those things are almost presented as if to say, look how great God is. He's going to solve all my problems for me. And I think if you listen to a lot of popular preaching today or listen to a lot of popular Christian music today, that almost seems to be the idea. That the focus isn't really on God and his glory, but God and his glory are a tool to make my life better. And that's something we need to watch out for. Another thing is what I would call culture-centered theology, where we're letting the culture drive what we're doing instead of the word driving what we're doing. And I think you you see this obviously in a lot of the the progressive woke church of our day that are just taking godless principles and saying that's what the church should be about. No, it's it's not. I think it's even possible to do this in a more conservative way where there might be more overlap of the values between that and the Bible, but it's still possible to really let the culture drive things to get the cart in front of the horse instead of we're going to proclaim the word. Certainly, 
Christians should not be shy about addressing the culture, but we're seeking to do that with the word of God first. We go to the word of God, we understand what it says, and then we seek to apply it to the culture. Not the other way around of looking at the culture and and trying to read that into the text. So we're always going to need to watch out for these things. Bad theology, self-centered theology, culture-centered theology. Because we've got something that's superior than all those things. One of the verses you'll see listed and even quoted on our website talking about this distinctive is Hebrews 4.12 which says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What we have here, what we hold in our hands is so precious and so powerful. Shame on us if we neglect this for our own inferior ideas. We need the word at the center of the church. So a, a practical thing is you hear the word taught, I want to encourage you to listen actively. Listen actively because you are hopefully not listening to some man's opinions. You're listening to the word of God. And so one thing I want to strongly encourage you to do every week is make sure you bring a copy of the word of God with you. And again, this is maybe my personal preference. I'd love it if it was a hard copy. There's no other apps in this that can uh, give you notifications and distract you like you can on your phone. But at the very least, have some way to look at the word of God when you come to church. Because that's what we're trying to say. And one thing that I'll make sure you should do is you should be looking at yourself to make sure, hey, what are you saying? Okay, yeah, that, that's matching up with what I am reading here. And I would also strongly encourage you to take notes because that's a, a way to think and to process what you are hearing. To be active, not just sitting there, taking it in, but, but to be active and even interacting in your own mind with what is being taught. Writing down the cross-references. Maybe if you know your Bible, thinking of some cross-references of your own or starting to think of questions or applications of the text. Listen actively because what is being discussed is so important. In Amos 8, verse 11 God speaks of judgment towards um, his people by saying that there will be a famine, not of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Uh, There's going to be a shortage of good preaching, in other words. There's going to be a shortage of a proclamation of God's truth. Is that not our culture? Could we not say in our culture there is a famine of the word of God? We need to proclaim it. We need to preach God's word. But notice that we, we've only got to two of the five imperatives there. Go back to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, and let's get to the other words. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. And then these three, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. These are strong words. Two of them are more negative, but similar. They're corrective, saying, stop doing this. And it may be referring to what we believe. Hey, well, you're thinking that, you're believing that, stop it. That's not true, that's not helpful. And, and this can also apply to our actions. Stop feeling this way, stop doing this. That's what God's word is going to tell us. And then it will also exhort. That's a, a strong word of encouragement, the idea to come alongside, that the word would come alongside and encourage us. So for both, again, the preacher and the hearer, The goal is not merely to understand the word, but to be changed by it. To be open to be corrected by the word and encouraged in another way. Point number three, seek the text's intended effect, which is really life change. Seek the text's intended effect to change your life. And if we're looking at our culture and and looking at ways that preaching, I think, misses the mark of what God would want it to be, obviously the biggest problem is preaching that's not based on God's word. Because that's not really preaching. You're not declaring the king's message. And that's that's a big problem. But another problem, and one you might find in, in more doctrinally sound places, is preaching that gives no real thought to what difference God's truth should make in our lives. And again, I'm not just trying to say that as my opinion. Just look at 2 Timothy. Look at how Paul is teaching Timothy how to preach. It seems that applying the word and telling people what to stop doing and encouraging them in what to do based on the word is an integral part of preaching. 
So good preaching not only relays the message of the king, it tells you what to do about it. Another one of my preaching heroes, Charles Spurgeon, said this, where the application begins, there the sermon begins. Or J.I. Packer said this, preaching is essentially teaching plus application. Where the plus is lacking, something less than preaching is taking place. And again, if you've been attending our church and you wonder, it seems like all the points they put up on the screens are like all imperatives. That's why. Again, the Bible doesn't say, hey, your outlines need this many points or they need to all be alliterated or they need to all be imperative. No, that's something we're doing to help people follow along with the message. But we've chosen, we want to make them all imperative so you can see this is not just meant to, oh, sit, listen, that was interesting. No, God's word is meant to change our lives. And sometimes those imperatives might be more focused on, hey, we should know this. Sometimes it's, hey, we we should feel this. Or other times, hey, we need to go and do this. There's always going to be a response to a correct understanding of God's word. And again, look, that's how I'm saying Paul's teaching Timothy to preach that way. And that's how Jesus taught. The longest sermon we have of Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's, Matthew chapters five through seven. And how does it end? With Jesus saying, hey, if, if you hear my words and do them, you're like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. If you hear my words and you don't do them, you're like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And as the old Sunday school song goes, then the house on the sand went splat, right? That's what's gonna happen to your life if you hear God's message, but you don't go and do it. So if we're learning preaching from Jesus or from Paul, it seems that the application is a crucial part of what goes on when God's word is to be preached. Now, those are strong words, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. But notice how that's to be done with complete patience and teaching. So even if it's strong, it should be done patiently and it should be done with teaching by explaining God's word. Preaching should not just be emotional hype and and the correction shouldn't just come from from shouting at at people. Certainly there's room for passion um, in preaching, but the the goal is through through teaching, right? I'm going to rebuke and reprove and exhort people by showing them what God's word says. I'm not just going to shout at everybody to stop doing this. I'm going to show them from God's word why they should stop doing this and how they should stop doing this. That is to be done by the teaching of God's word. So if, if we're seeking the text's intended effect, the, the final practical thing I want to give you to think through is to apply thoughtfully. Apply thoughtfully. And really the application should be a part of all three of those steps. Preparing prayerfully. You should be praying ahead of time for the application. You should be praying ahead of time. God, I want to be reproved, rebuked, and exhorted by your word. I want to be corrected and directed by your word. Would you prepare my heart for that? Even when you're listening actively, one thing you should be thinking about already as you're hearing the sermon is the application. And if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to take notes not only on the information, but also to take notes on the application. Maybe you need to write down, as you're listening to the sermon, I need to forgive this person. Or, you know, I need to stop thinking this. And then make sure you don't leave your notes behind so we, you know, no. We already have the microphones hidden in your houses to know all of that stuff. No, just kidding, we don't. Um, We need to be seeking that in every step. Before, I'm already praying about how I can apply it. Listening, I'm thinking about how I can apply it. And then I'm going and I'm reflecting. And obviously, a great way you can do this is by looking at the application questions on the back of the worksheet, going to a life group and discussing this. But even if you can't, do that still to pray, to, to take some of what you learned in God's word and to, to pray about it in your own time with God, to journal or reflect on it, to see well, how is this going to change my life? What do I need to know or feel or do that is different in my life based on what I heard from God's word? And uh, again, one thing I want to warn us about, this was a phrase my old pastor used that I really liked, we need to beware of the L-shaped amen. That's, that's where it's like, oh yeah, God, that's great. So-and-so over here needs to hear it, right? That's not what we're talking about with apply thoughtfully. It doesn't say apply thoughtfully for other people. I'm talking about yourself. And that's easy to do because it's easy to be like, oh yeah, that's great, God. Our pagan culture needs to hear that. And that's true a lot of the time. But are you skipping over yourself 
in that. Or it's, oh yeah, God, I need to hear that. This person in my small group needs to hear that. Or my spouse needs to hear that. That's maybe the most common L-shaped amen. No, it's no, God, I need to hear this because I need to be reproved, rebuked, and exhorted by the word. As James 1 reminds us, we need to not just be hearers of the word. We need to be doers of the word. And that's why before I've, I've even said the end of the sermon is like halftime of the game. Well, now we're going to actually see whether we're going to win or lose. Now we're going to see what the real effect is. And even sometimes when I'm feeling really cheeky, when somebody says, oh, great sermon, Pastor Ben, I'll say, well, we'll see. We'll see. Because it's not really dependent on what I said. Is it going to change anything? And that's, that's where we all have a part to play in that. We want to do what God's word has said. And I want you to see the benefit of that. It might be like, ooh, I don't want to get reproved and rebuked. But that's, that's, that's good because it's God's word. We want God's word to tell us what to do. Even as I think about those sermon evaluations and how intimidating that, revir- that environment could be, you know what? Those were really, really helpful. Because I'm sitting there and even, hey, I'm working at this church because I think this guy is one of the best preachers today I can find. I want to learn from him. And so even though some of it's kind of, ooh, yeah, he's right, it's going to help me do, do better at what it is that God has called me To do. That's how we should view preaching. Hey, God's word's gonna tell me some uncomfortable things, but that's okay because who better to hear that from than God? And that's where, again, the goal is not so much that you're hearing from the preacher, it's that you're hearing from the word of God and that the preacher is showing this to you from the word of God. As we close, turn with me to Psalm 119. And if you want to reflect on the Bible, This is a great psalm to read. It's the longest psalm in the Bible, therefore the longest chapter in the Bible. And it's clearly all centered around God's word. And one thing, if you read the whole thing, will be clear is it's not just a love for knowing God's word. From the very beginning, it's a passion to do God's word. Verse 4 says, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. But turn with me to verse 130. I love how this is phrased. The unfolding of your words gives light. And that's a beautiful picture of preaching or even just personal Bible study. The unfolding of God's word. We want to take God's word. We want to unfold it. We want to examine it. We want to learn and see what it's saying. And when we do that, it gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And then get a load of this in verse 131. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Somebody tries to tell you, man, you're taking this whole Bible thing too seriously. Show them this verse. I open up my mouth and pant. And then look, because I long for your commandments, I am panting after I want God to tell me what to do. Right? There's a hunger there, a thirst even for application. I want to know God's commandments so that I might keep them. When you get home today and you look at your thermostat, you're hoping to see a nice temperature on there. You're hoping to see that the thermostat has kept your house where it needs to be. Well, much more than that, you certainly want to see your life headed in the right direction. How is that going to happen? It's only going to happen when you set it according to the thermostat of God's word and the faithful preaching of it. Let's pray together.